Well, good morning to all of you. I've been already up here a couple of times, but I haven't had a chance to say good morning yet. So good morning, everyone. It's great to have you uh, with us today. Good morning to our online campus. Thanks for jumping on and being a part with us. We're glad that you're with us today. And uh, believe it or not, we've already wrapped up our summer series. I know you're thinking, it's 117. What do you mean we've wrapped up our summer series? But uh, kids in, in, in Chandler went back to school this past week, and, and uh, we're, we're wrapped up our summer series. And before we launch into a new one, I just want to take a moment and say thank you to our staff. Summer is always a great time because we get the staff involved. We have all of them come and share on the Sunday morning, and, and I think they did a fantastic job. And so can you, would you put your hands together and just say thank you to all of our staff for sharing. The word with you this, this summer, it's always fun to hear them and hear what God is doing in their life and see them growing and, and gaining confidence in presenting the word of God. And so uh, I love our summers for that. But we are kicking off a new series today. So I want you to grab your Bibles and, and, and pull them out because I want you to follow along with me and uh, take, get something to take some notes with. If you want a, an outline, you can go to our app, which is Desert Springs AZ. And there's an electronic version of the outline there that you can follow along and and fill in the blanks if you want to do that as well. Um, but we're talking today about actually kicking off a series called Effective Christian. Effective Christian. And uh, I, I just want to, out of my spirit, I want to encourage you today. Um, something that I've been seeing, something I've experience, been experiencing as, as I've been, you know, just watching and, and, and allowing the staff to speak there. Through this summer, summer is typically a downtime for, for the church and we just traditionally historically we've seen kind of a trend where I know there's seven weeks of summer right and, and seven weeks of school break and people got to scatter they got to go vacations they got to do whatever and 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 yet through this summer we have been experiencing growth church I want you to hear that we, we've been growing we grew this summer attendance is up finances are up God is doing something. There is a, a stirring. There is a moving. And, and I really believe it's, it's divine momentum. Divine momentum. And here's my challenge. God creates, I believe, these moments and opportunities of momentum, but it's our responsibility to steward them. We have to steward the blessing of God. And when, when the momentum of God begins to rest on a church, Listen, if the church will steward that momentum, man, who knows what God's going to do? Because momentum just gets building and building. It's like, you know, a snowball going down a hill and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And, you know, by the time it gets to the bottom of this hill, it's this huge snowball and it's just taking everything out. You can't stop. That's what happens with momentum. And so here's my challenge. God, I, I to you, from God, I believe is, is there is... Uh, stirring. God is moving. There's something that God is up to in the context of our church. My question to you is, are you willing to help steward it? Man, it's really quiet in here today. Wake your neighbor up. Slap him if you need to. Do whatever you need to do. Wake him up. Are you willing to help steward what God wants to do in this place? And so if that's the case, then I just want, I just want you to just I'm not asking for a show of hands. I'm not asking you to stand up. I don't want you to sign anything. I just want you to determine something down in your gut. It says, you know what, God, I want all that you have for me and for my church. I'm ready. I'm ready. And I'm going to do what I have to do. I'm going to make being in your presence, being in church, being in, in, in Sunday services, and, and make sure my kids are in, in kids' area and, and my youth are coming on Wednesday nights. Why? Because I'm going to help to steward what you're doing. See, we can't be praying, God move, God move, God move. And when he begins to move, we do nothing. We have to respond. And so I'm excited by what I'm seeing. And so I'm just, I'm helping you. I hope you're seeing it. And I hope you're ready to help steward it. All right? That's just for free. That has nothing to do with my message today. That's just something that uh, I've been stirring in my spirit that I wanted to share with you. All right? Uh, but we want to talk about this idea of being an effective Christian. How many of you would say, honestly, that, that down on the inside of you, there is this desire, this kind of a, a, a burning, maybe even a calling that you feel that you want your life to count. You want your life to matter. You don't want to just come, be born, and 
live for however many years you live and then you die and you have made zero contribution to mankind. Now, I want my life to count. I want my life to matter. I want my life to make a difference. And I believe as Christians, even more so, when we, when we come to understand the grace and the mercy of God, when he's forgiven us and, and our lives have been transformed, we, we have this calling, if you will, to help share that message, that good news with everybody around us, right? And so the, there's this desire within us to, to, to make a difference. We want our lives to count. We want to be an effective Christian. But sometimes we just don't know how to do that. So what we're going to be doing over the next few weeks is we're going to discover out of the book of 2 Peter. In fact, if you want to turn there right now, 2 Peter we're going to spend the next several weeks right here in this, in this book. And we're going to discover what, what Peter is saying to us about how we can be effective Christians. How our lives can make a difference. Now, let me give you some background before we dive in and actually read this passage. Let me give you a little bit of context here. This book, 2 Peter, is actually a letter that Peter wrote, the Apostle Peter wrote. It's his second letter that he wrote to a group of people that were living in an area or a region called Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. There were these churches that were there, and he's writing these letters to them to encourage them and instruct them and to teach them. And so he's writing this letter, called we call it Second Peter. It's a second letter to this group. And he writes it in uh, 66 to 67 A.D., Right? And uh, that's significant because we understand from history that shortly after the writing of this second letter, Peter is executed in Rome by the Emperor Nero for being a Christian. So literally what's happening is he's probably in prison in Rome. In fact, if you read 2 Peter chapter 1 down around verses 14 and 15, Peter has come to the realization that he's going to be dying soon. He writes it right in the letter that we're looking at. My life is about over. And so I'm taking this last opportunity to share some things with you. It's like his final words to these people. This is the last time he's going to be able to communicate with them. And shortly after he writes this letter, he is executed. But if you dig in and you, and you, and you kind of look at the overall theme, the overarching idea that he's trying to communicate to this group of believers in this day was this. Diligently pursue a godly lifestyle. That's his message to them. If you kind of lump it, this whole letter together, what, what he's trying to say is you need to chase after God. You need to desire and pursue a godly lifestyle. That your behavior, that the way that you live, the way that you act, the way you walk, the way you talk, would be done in a way that would honor God. Now understand, he's saying this at a time when the culture in Rome and the surrounding area was pretty rough to be a Christian. I know we've talked about our culture. We've talked about the changes that we see in our culture and how, how hard it is sometimes to take a stand and be a believer. Hey, at least we weren't being executed. The culture in Rome was way more difficult at this time to live a godly life. But yet he's saying to them, here's my message to you. Here's my final words. Diligently pursue a godly lifestyle. Live for God with everything that you've got. Give it your all. And then he says this, and I want you to, to, to look with me. And this is going to be our kind of our key passage for this series. There's four verses here that we're going to look at. He says to the, this to them, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5-8, through eight, he says, For this reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Understand what he's saying here. He gives us a list of these qualities, and he says, if you have these, they're going to help you to be an effective Christian. They're going to keep you from being ineffective. So I want us to break down today a little bit this, these verses so that we can really kind of understand and grab a hold of what Peter is, is saying here. The first line there, look at this. It says, for this reason. Just stop right there for a second. For what reason? Or in order for you to understand the reason, you have to go back to the previous two verses, verse 3 and verse 4. 
And it's in, in those verses where he says this. He basically declares to them that everything that they need to live a godly lifestyle, they already have. That God has already provided it for them. That, uh, that everything you need, all the, all the strength, all the wisdom, all the counsel, all the direction, all the power, everything that you need to live the life that God has called you to live, he's already provided it for you. And he's provided it for you through his promises. He calls them the great and precious promises of God. And it's through those promises when we, we grab a hold of them in faith and we begin to live our lives based upon God's fulfillment of those prophet, uh, pr promises in our lives that he gives us everything through those to live victorious Christian lives. I uh, tried to do a little bit of a study on how many promises are in the word of God. And, and there, there's, the, the numbers are all over everywhere. But here's what I did discover. There are more than 7,000 promises in the word of God that are directly from God to us. <laughs> Think of that. There are more than 7,000 times in the word of God where God is making, it's not, it's not man twisting God's arm. It's not us writing something and saying, I hope God will do this. I hope we can manipulate God into, to, 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 to keeping this promise. These are promises that God made to us. And as we stand in faith and we read the word of God and, and as we're reading, we come across a promise, we can go, well, I wonder, wonder if that's for me. Yes. Yes, it is. Every promise that you read, you can say, that's for me. That's mine. That's God's word for me. And when we do that, when we grab a hold of those promises and we hold on to faith, he equips us everything that we need to live a godly life. It's already promised to us and he, he will fulfill it. And he says, by adding them to our lives, it helps us to escape the corruption of the world. As we grow in our relationship with God and our lives are transformed as believers, we can escape the corruption of the world. We're not escaping the world. We're still in the world, but we can, we can stand strong in the midst of a culture that is trying to say, you got to go this way, you got to do this, you got to act this way, you got to think this way. You can stand strong and overcome it. Escape the corruption of the world. How? By leaning into the promises of God. And then he says this, for this reason. Because God has already given you everything you need to do this through his great and precious promises. And, and when you lean into them, you can overcome the world. So he says, then, then do this. For this reason, make every effort to add to your faith. Add your faith. Now just stop right there for a second. What does that mean to add to my faith? Are you saying, Pastor, that my, my faith in Jesus is not enough? Because I've believed this whole time, and Pastor, you preach about it. All you got to do is ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart and ask him to forgive you of your sins and, and to be your Lord and Savior. And, and you lead us in that prayer every week and give people an opportunity every week. And, and you say, you're saved and you're on the way here. Are you changing the script on us, Pastor? Are you trying to tell us now that that our faith in Jesus is not enough and we got to add to it? Well, t time out. Don't go down that rabbit hole. Because that's not the context of what we're talking about here. We're not talking about faith for salvation. Okay? We're talking about our faith in Jesus Christ to be an effective Christian. Don't get sideways on the context. Because yes, your faith alone is what gets you into heaven. For by grace are you saved, what? Through faith. It's a gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. If you confess with your mouth... Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Your faith in Jesus is what saves you. When you put your faith and your trust in him and you ask him to, to come into your heart, to forgive you of your sins, to be your savior, to be your Lord, understand that, that, that process of you being saved, forgiven, transformed, that's what you need to do in order to get to heaven. It's not by works, it's not by deeds, it's through faith in Jesus. That is the foundation that we build our lives upon, okay? In fact, 
Uh, let me give you a couple passages of scripture. There's one in Isaiah chapter 7. The prophet Isaiah is speaking to King Ahaz, who is freaking out because there's this massive army that's coming to attack the nation. And, uh, and, and Isaiah essentially says this to him. Look at this, second part of uh, verse 9. If you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. If you don't stand firm in your faith that God is going to see you through, you won't stand at all. And, and, and it applies to us. Understand, our faith in Jesus Christ needs to be the foundation of our lives. And if we don't have that faith, we're not going to make it through. Jesus himself puts it this way, Matthew chapter 7, 24 and 25. says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. We put our faith, our trust in Jesus and in his word. And it is the foundation that we build our lives upon. So, so don't get sideways on that. You need to have faith in Jesus Christ, and faith alone in Jesus is what gets you to heaven. Okay? But that's not the context of what Peter is talking about here. He's encouraging them on what they need to do to move beyond their faith in Jesus Christ so that they can live an effective Christian lifestyle in the midst of a culture that is anti-God. That's the context. And so what he's saying to them is this, you need to add to your faith. And by adding to our faith, it, it just literally means to generously supplement. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to generously supplement. And, and it just alludes to the fact that there's an expectation of continual growth. As a child of God, as a believer, you got to keep growing in your faith. It's not, hey, I raised my hand and I prayed that prayer and I'm good now forever. Well, you're, you've, you've been forgiven, but there's now an expectation that you're going to grow in your faith. You're going to get closer and closer and closer to Jesus. You're going to get to know him. And, and the idea of being a Christian means you're going to be Christ-like. How can you mimic someone you don't know? How can you act like someone that you, you don't know, you haven't spent time with? See, our goal, our desire is, it should be every day when I get up, should be my desire. Today, I want to be a little bit more like Jesus than I was yesterday. Just a little bit more like Jesus than, than yesterday. And then tomorrow when I get up, my goal needs to be, I want to be a little bit more like Jesus today than I was yesterday. And you may think, well, that's just, that's such a slow process. I know, but it beats no process at all. And where will you be after a week? Where will you be after a month? Where will you be after a year or two or 10? See, there's this continual process of you growing and becoming more and more and more like Jesus, taking on his nature. And, and in this verse that we just read, Peter gives us a list of seven different characteristics, seven different qualities. And he says, listen, I want you to, to possess these. I want you to add these to your faith. And you should possess these qualities in an ever-increasing fashion or manner, meaning they should all be growing in you. All these things should be growing in us. And if we do that, if we add them to our faith and they're growing and, and, and enlarging and increasing in us, they will keep us from being ineffective and unproductive. Ineffective and unproductive. When we read this, this passage, we're like, yeah, that, I don't want that. I don't want to be ineffective. I, I have that calling. I have that desire. I want my life to count. I want it to, to, to make a difference, right? I don't want to be an ineffective Christian. I don't want to be unproductive then we need to add these qualities to our faith. But here's the problem with that. I wonder how many times we have read through the New Testament and we read through 2 Peter and we've gotten to this passage and we've gotten to this letter that, that Peter wrote as his final words of encouragement to this group of believers in, in, in Asia Minor. And he's saying, listen, you need to, to diligently grow in your faith, live godly lives. And here's how, and you can add these seven qualities and we read through that and we say, yeah, I don't want to be ineffective. Yeah, I don't want to be unproductive. And then we just keep reading. We just keep, keep reading. And we've missed the whole point of the list. We don't add them to our faith. 
In fact, without looking at your Bible, do you even know what the first one is? No, because we just kept reading. I'm trying to read my Bible, Pastor. I know, but there's sometimes we need to stop. And we need to grab a hold of what it says. Do, don't move on until you get it down in here. And so what we're going to do over the next few weeks is we're going we're to look at this list. Because he's saying if you add these qualities, if you add these characteristics, they will help you to be an effective follower of Jesus Christ. Isn't that what we want? All right. So the first one that we're going to look at today is the, the quality or the characteristic of goodness. Goodness. Okay, we know what goodness is, right? Well, I mean, yeah, if something's good, what does that mean? Well, it's better than bad, right? Someone says, how are you doing? If you're having an okay day, you say, I'm good. good. Or if you're having a horrible day and you just don't want to talk about it, you say, I'm good. Right? If someone's talking about their favorite dessert and it's got all kinds of chocolate in there, they, they say, it's got all kinds of chocolate goodness in it. Right? Have you heard that? We, we, we use this word good or goodness for a lot of different things, but what really does it mean? What, is, what does it mean? In your Bible, that word goodness may also... Depending on the translation, you may see the word virtue in this list. Add to your faith virtue. Those two words kind of go together. But virtue, I mean, have you ever used a sentence that had the word virtue in it? I haven't, I don't think. Well, what do you mean by virtue? What does that mean? And so let's dive into this. Let's study this. Let's figure this out. So the actual Greek word here that's used, that, that Peter actually used, is arete, A-R-E-T-E. And what it means is this, moral excellence, purity, modesty. So what is Peter saying? In the midst of a culture that is wicked, evil, and perverse, if you want to be an effective believer, an effective follower of Jesus Christ, add to your faith moral excellence. Moral excellence. Well, what does that mean? That means that when we're trying to figure out what is right and what is wrong and how we should live and how we should act and how we should talk and how we should treat other people and the attitudes that we should have, we need to go back to the word of God, not to what culture says. When we are determining our values and our morals and our beliefs, it's not based upon, well, this is what I feel. This is what I think. I'm sorry, that's self-religion. That's basically saying, well, I'm God, and so I'm going to make up the rules about what's right and wrong for my own life. Understand what you're saying. I'm God. I'm sorry, but you're not God. There is a God that has laid out for us in his word what the values and morals and belief system of, of our life should be. And so what Peter is saying is add to your faith moral excellence. Godly values, godly morals, godly beliefs. Live your life in such a way that it would please God. I mean, I've talked with so many people and, and they've got all these different ideas and, and, and philosophies and, and, and it's like, well, I believe this and it's from Christianity and I believe this and it's from Islam and I believe this is from Buddhism and I believe this and it's from New Age and they got all this stuff and they're just making it up as they go depending on how it feels to them. Do you see how dangerous that, dangerous that is? My values and my morals are based upon what feels right to me? I'm sorry, the word of God says that we are all desperately wicked. Our human nature is evil. And if we're depending on how we feel, man, we're gonna have a list of morals that are all messed up. A list of values that are all upside down in comparison to the word of God. And so what, we're, what we need to add to our faith is this idea of moral excellence. So I'm going to give you four questions today that you, I want to challenge you to, to take some time this next week and just to ask yourself these questions. Take some time to really think about it. Here's four questions that we're just going to look through real quick this morning. The first one is this. Is your life, your life characterized by moral excellence? Your life characterized, meaning 
If someone were to step back and have a conversation about you, would one of the things that would mark you and set you apart be that you are a person of upstanding morals? That you live a godly life? Think about that. Would your characterization, how people think about you, how people describe you, be a person of moral excellence? Number two, are your speech, your actions, and your choices morally excellent? Your speech, the things that you say, your actions, how you live your life and how you treat other people and the choices that you make, are they all morally excellent? We just talked about going back to school. Students, she <clears throat> had a great summer. You went to camp, and man, God rocked your world at camp, and you just got so close, and great times of praise and worship and, and serving God. And then you, and some of you went off and, and did a mission trip to the Navajo Nation, and man, you were pouring out, and you were loving people and, and encouraging people. And then school started on Wednesday. And when you got back to school on Wednesday... Thursday and Friday, three days you've been there. Have you slidden back into the old habits, the old lifestyle, hanging out with the wrong crowd, doing, saying, acting the wrong way? And parents, I'm not just picking on the teens. What about you when you go to work? Living a life of moral excellence isn't just on Sundays from 10 to 11.30. It's when you're stuck in rush hour traffic and you're already late for work. And that person cuts you off again for the third time because they just keep going back and forth in front of you. How's your moral excellence in that moment? See, it's really easy for us to point a finger at other people, but let's own it right here. Your speech, your actions, your, your, your thoughts, your attitudes, your lifestyle, is it one of moral excellence? Because in order for us to be effective, we got to be people that have a standard, a godly standard that we choose to live our lives by. Let's go on. Third question. Does your life reflect to others the nature and character of God? The way that you live, the way that you act, these words that you say and the attitudes that you have and the way that you treat people, does it reflect to other people your God? Does it, does it help to describe to them or show them God's nature and God's character? Because the way that we live should be a declaration of the God that we serve. Right after we first moved into this building about 15 years ago, um, we wanted to you know, get the word out and let people know that we were you know, in, in a new place. And, and so we had those, window, those church window decals made up for everybody to go in your cars, Right? And because uh, everybody was doing it, everybody wanted a window decal. All the churches in town had a decal. So we got to get our, our, our people to drive around the, the, the community and they, Desert Springs Church. But, and I started thinking about it. I'm like, wait, wait a minute, time out. Before we pass these out, it's almost like I need to have a signed agreement with you. You're going to put this on your car? then here's how you're going to act while you're driving your car. Are we in agreement? Because I don't need you flipping people off. And as you fly by, Desert Springs Church. It doesn't work. Okay, and, and, and so we've got to make sure that we, we're in agreement here that if we're going to call ourselves, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. But then the way we act, the way we treat other people, the things that we say, the attitudes that we have is completely contrary to, to being a follower of Jesus Christ. And look what 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 says. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises. And I want you to circle that word, the, pra the praises, circle that. That you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. That you would declare the praises. You might be interested to note that that word in the Greek is goodness or virtue, arete. That you would declare the moral excellence of your God is what it actually is saying. 
You and I, as followers of Jesus Christ, should live our lives in such a way that our lives declare how great our God is. Our lives declare the goodness, the virtue, the moral excellence of our God. We let everybody know by how we live how good our God is. And then the fourth question that I want to challenge you with today is this. Do you walk in the power and the anointing of God? Well, Pastor Brad, what does that have to do with goodness? What does walking in the power, walking in the anointing of God have to do with adding to my faith goodness? Well, I want you to look at this passage with me. It's Mark chapter 5. In Mark chapter 5, there is a story of a woman who has been suffering in her body with a sickness, a disease, we call it the issue of, of blood, that, that for years and years and years and years, she'd gone to all kinds of doctors and no one was able to help her. She spent all kinds of money. No one was able to, 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 to bring healing to her body. And so she's at a desperate place. And she hears about Jesus, that he's coming by. And even though it was against law for her to, to be in the crowd because she was unclean because of this a flow of blood. She's not supposed to be around anybody. She, she pushed past the religious tradition, the religious laws. She said, if I, if I can just get close to Jesus, if I can just get to him and if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I know, I know I will be healed. So the story goes that Jesus was coming and there was a huge crowd and everybody was pushing and wanting to get close and everybody was reaching out to touch him and to pat him on the back. And she fought through that crowd. And as Jesus was walking by, she didn't ask for an audience. She didn't jump out in front of him and say, I need to talk to you. She said, as he passes by, I'll just reach out. And in faith, I will grab the hem of his garment, and I know that I will be healed. And that's exactly what happened. As he went by, she reached out, and when she grabbed the hem of his garment, something changed. In fact, I want you to see it. It's Mark chapter 5, verse 30. And look what it says. At once, Jesus realized that power, notice the word, that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? Notice what it says. At once, Jesus realized that power, depending on the Bible that you have in your hands right now, it may say Jesus realized that virtue had left him. Oh, you need to see something here. The disciples said, well, Jesus, everybody's touching you. Everybody, everybody's wanting to, to touch you and to pat you on the back and to say hi and encourage you. No, he said, no, 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 somebody, somebody touched me in faith. And when they touched me in faith, power, virtue, the moral excellence of God left me and touched them, is what he's saying. What does that mean, Pastor? Well, understand that in every moment, in every season, in every opportunity, because God is a God of moral excellence, everything that he does and the timing of everything that he does is absolutely perfect. That's moral excellence. So in that moment, understand what needed to be done was that the power of God will respond to the faith of a woman who didn't even want an audience. She just said, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I know I have enough faith to believe that God even though I don't talk to him, even though he doesn't even know I'm around, he'll respond. Because God always does exactly what is right and perfect because he is a God of virtue, a God of moral excellence. And so in that moment, the right thing for a holy, sovereign God was that healing flowed and touched her in response to her faith. The anointing and the power that we would refer to as the dunamis of God was coupled with the virtue, the moral excellence of God to bring the healing that she needed. So when Peter is saying to us, understand, you need to add to your faith goodness, moral excellence, that you would have a godly lifestyle. And with that, 
God will bring his anointing and his power to rest upon your life so that at any moment, at any opportunity, as you walk through life, living a life of moral excellence, the anointing and the power and the spirit of God can touch you to bring life and hope and healing and encouragement and deliverance for anybody that's around you as you step out in faith and allow the spirit of God to minister through you to touch them. Well, come on, church. Come on, church. God's anointing and power is for you. For you. God wants to, to flow through you to touch people's lives. What did he say? Greater works shall you do than these, right? There is an anointing that we are missing. There's an anointing that we are not walking in. Why? Because we're not walking in moral excellence. And I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you. He's saying, listen, come on, add to your faith. The next few weeks, our goal is to supplement, to richly supplement, to generously supplement our faith so that we can be believers, followers who are effective, who are productive in our faith. So here's the statement. To live an effective Christian life, generously supplement your faith with goodness. With goodness. And what we're going to do is we're going to study the other ones in the weeks to come. But that's our challenge for this week. Go back and ask yourself these four questions that we, that we laid out. God, have I just accepted the, the standard of culture or am I living by the standard of your word? Am I taking my standards, my morals, my beliefs, my guidelines out of your word or from culture? God, help me, help me to live the way that you want me to live. That's our challenge. But obviously that all begins by you and I having a relationship with Jesus Christ because we talk first and foremost is our faith. That's why he says, add to your faith. It starts with faith. It starts with you believing that Jesus is the Savior and the Lord. You asking him to come into your life, forgive you of your sins. And so we want to give you an opportunity to do that today. So would you do this? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? And if you're here this morning and you, you'd be honest enough to say, Pastor, I, I don't know that I've ever done that. I don't know that I've ever asked Jesus Christ into my life. I don't know that I've ever asked him to forgive me of my sins. I don't know that I really have that kind of faith. I, I mean, I, I believe in God, but I, I don't know him as my personal savior. Friend, today's your day. Today's the day. And so I wanna, in just a moment, I wanna I'll lead you in a prayer. I'll pray with you and, and help you to, to, to make that decision. But if that's you, where you know, in your heart of hearts, you know, all right, think, things between me and God are not what they need to be. And so I need to make a fresh commitment of my life. I need, I need him as my savior and my Lord. If that's you today, I want you just to slip up your hand and say, Pastor, include me in that prayer. Just slip it up and say, that's, that's me, include me in that prayer. Right now, just slip it up, anybody? Yep, right here, thank you, thank you. Anyone else? Say, that's me, that's me. I, I, I know my heart is not right with God and I need it to be, I want it to be before I walk out of this room. Include me in that prayer, Pastor. If that's you, just slip it up. Just slip it up right over here. Yep, thank you. Thank you. No one else? Don't want to miss you. We're going to pray in just a second. Hallelujah. All right. Let's pray this prayer together. All right? Let's pray. Now. And as I pray, just repeat it right out loud. The church is going to pray with you, but let's pray together. Dear Jesus, thank you for loving me, even though I don't deserve it. I've sinned, I've done things that are wrong, and I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Come into my heart, be my savior, and be my Lord. And God help me to live for you from this moment on with the rest of my life. I thank you right now for a brand new start. And I pray this in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Now look up here. Hey, I want to thank you for joining us today and being part of our online service. And if you prayed that prayer with us this morning, first of all, let me say this. Congratulations and welcome to the family of God. You made a fantastic decision today. 
And our job as a church is to come alongside and to help you understand the decision that you made, the prayer that you prayed, and really to answer the question, what now? What do I do now? What's next? And so there's gonna be a tab that pops up that said a raised hand. I'm gonna ask you to click on that and connect with our service host. Because what we wanna do is send you a gift. That gift is a book called Following Jesus. And it'll help you to understand the prayer you just prayed, the decision that you made, and how to move forward from this point on. But let me just say, congratulations. We are so excited that you made that decision to follow Jesus Christ. It's the best decision that you've ever made. Also, if you're a guest with us today, thanks for joining us. There's a tab for you as well. It says, I'm new. If you'd click on that and let us know that you joined us this morning, we'd love to connect with you and fill you in about all the different things that are going on here at Desert Springs Church. Hope you had a, a great time this morning being a part of our service. We love you. Hope to see you next week. God bless.